Welcome into The Verge, a show which covers the Baltimore Orioles minor leagues. The Verge is part of BSL Radio. Baltimore Sports and Life is dedicated to analysis and discussion on the Orioles, Baltimore Ravens, and the University of Maryland. The site has a team of writers providing coverage of those teams and houses live streaming content weekly. Join the conversations at the message board, like BSL on Facebook, and follow BSL on Twitter. On Twitter. Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and even earn money all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since we discovered Spotify for Podcasters, we feel like having options like video podcasts and Q&A lets us be more creative on another level. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. Hello, Birdland, and welcome to this weekend's mailbag episode. Nick Stevens here taking some questions from our Patreon group about the minors, majors, really whatever you want to ask or discuss. We use this opportunity to have some fun with our most loyal listeners and incorporate some more Major League talk into the show now that the Major League roster is full of guys who were just young prospects in rookie ball or low A even when we began this show a couple of years ago. A reminder, you can become a patron by heading over to patreon.com slash on the verge. We have multiple different levels you can sign up at. A seven-day free trial is available to everyone. You get daily minor league podcast recap shows and invite to our extremely active patron chat and plenty more bonus episodes and perks for becoming a member. So I would definitely encourage you to check that out if you haven't. Still plenty of time left in the season and even in the offseason, the content does not stop for us. But let's go ahead and dive into this weekend's questions here, beginning with one from Alex. Alex says, where would you rank that first game of the race series on the best wins of the year list? Referring to now Thursday night's game, in case you were listening to this much later on. So I couldn't tell you an exact ranking, uh, but it was certainly one of the bigger wins of the year because you're coming off a series loss against the Dodgers, and then you hit the road against a Rays team that has been in first place all year until Wednesday when the Orioles were able to salvage that win in that Dodger series. You climb to the top spot in the division. You've got your veteran leader on the bump who's been struggling in Kyle Gibson. Cedric Mullins comes out before that game and says he hopes he's back by the end of the season when we were thinking he, he could maybe be out for a few days, maybe a week or so. And now it's looking like, can we get Cedric Mullins back within the next month or so? But you got a very good, very young team facing a very prominent Tampa Bay team on the road suddenly playing as the top dogs now. So how do these young guys respond? And they responded with a big win. Gibbons pitched very well. Gunner had himself a huge night defensively. Colton Kowser, who is facing so much unnecessary criticism, as he gets the go-ahead RBI. Uh, Eventually turns out to be the game-winning RBI in extra innings. So now you see this when you're suddenly expecting Colton Kowser to become a more prominent contributor on the Major League roster as well. So that was a good sign to see. I'm recording this Friday night, so I don't know what's going to happen Saturday or Sunday and how this series ends up. But if they can win this series, and you can look back at Thursday's game potentially as one of the more important wins of the year. I think too many people get way too high or way too low on a game-by-game basis. Like this is baseball. It's, it's not football. You can have four disastrous games over a 10-game span, but still go 6-4 and four and gain ground on your opponents and be in a great spot as a team. So I don't tend to look at baseball on such a micro level, but as long as this series ends up in the Orioles' favor, I think, yeah, you can rank Thursday's win, considering all the factors involved there, a pretty huge one. I want to say season-altering, but definitely uh, a major win here as we enter, we're about to enter August. Uh, season, there's still a lot of baseball left, but it's that period where there's a lot of baseball left, but not really a lot of baseball left. These games, especially against the Rays and other ALS teams, are going to start mattering a whole lot more here. Move on out to a question from David who asked, how many home runs will Jackson Holiday hit in April 2024? Uh, so I know Bob touched on this a little bit in last weekend's episode, I believe. And there was some good discussion about this topic in our Patreon chat, which again, if you want spirited discussions, but cordial and respectful disagreements about issues that lead to productive conversations about the Orioles, check that out. Um, 
will Jackson Holiday essentially be on the Orioles opening day roster next year? I think it's extremely viable. Like he scorched his way through Delmarva, came out hot in Aberdeen, but high pitchers tamed him a little bit for a stretch there, but Holiday came out on top after just a few weeks, earned the promotion to double A at the age of 19 and at the all-star break at that. At the time of this recording, like Holiday has a hit in five of six games with Bowie and has reached base in all six games he's played in. Very, very small sample size, but I mean, he's hitting 375. He has a WRC plus of 146. Still very impressive walk to strikeout numbers. 11% walk rate to a 15% strikeout rate. Again, these numbers have probably changed since I recorded that, but still. Norfolk season does run a little bit longer. They've already clinched a spot in the playoffs, so there's more games for the Tides there. And as long as these final few weeks of the year go well, I think Holiday very easily could end the year in Norfolk. They give him that week or so taste with the Tides. And I feel pretty confident in saying that. Like, Sure, it's easy to say Michael Elias and the Orioles will hold his rookie status for 2025. And maybe that was the original plan. But I think Holiday has definitely forced that issue. He's moving too quickly and playing too well to keep him down. And if you have Kerstad and Holiday on the active roster, then you have two chances at that extra draft pick. And Holiday could genuinely make this roster so much better. I strongly believe that plenty of us fans, myself included, uh, underestimate what type of talent Holiday is. You can nitpick his game like the ground ball rate. Yeah, he might hit too many balls on the ground, but I promise you the home runs are coming. The defense is beyond his years, and he's already showing an impressive glove at the AA level. It's only July 2023, and we're talking about April 2024. So, I mean, I'm going to have some fun with this question and say that, you know, let's, why not? Holiday is on the active roster, uh, and he hits five home runs, April 2024. Bookmark that one. Uh, Colin asks, should the Orioles trade for an outfielder while Mullins is out? And jokingly ask why it should be DJ Stewart. Colin, uh, we're going to reevaluate your membership into our Patreon group after bringing up a DJ Stewart reference. But now I'm going to say it again because, well, I'm not going to say DJ Stewart's name again because legend has it if you say his name three times, he haunts your dreams. But I don't think the Orioles need to trade for an outfielder. You've got Aaron Hicks and Colton Cowser. If you don't want Kowser in center field as much as you might need him as he adjusts to playing defense in the majors, then, you know, I hate to say it, and I don't want it, this to be the case, but this organization will probably turn back to Ryan McKenna for the defense if they feel like they need it. Um, and it, if you're fine rolling Kowser out in center field, then you could go corner outfield route and give Stowers another opportunity. I think you can piece together options until Mullins returns. I just don't see a need to trade for a one- or two-month rental outfielder. It just doesn't seem like a smart decision at this point. Trade for more bullpen help. Trade for a starter if possible. But if Mullins is doing everything but running right now, this team has not been a disaster without him. They're continuing to win ball games, And that's not a knock on Cedric Mullins at all. This team needs Cedric Mullins. If this team wants to make a deep playoff run, if this team wants to somehow make it to the World Series, they're going to need a healthy Cedric Mullins leading the way here. It sucks not to have one of your best players on the field, and you are going to see a drop in production at that position, but really no matter how you piece this together, but I think this team will do a pretty good job of staying afloat while he is out, and hopefully he is back much sooner than later. Uh, we're going to go another question from David here, who says, what is your feeling about all the new bandwagon fans since Orioles are good at winning now? Um, I feel like this is a bait question, but I'm going to say, welcome, Like glad to have you back, but... Just just calm down a little bit. Like I'm not trying to gatekeep Orioles fandom here. I like to consume baseball in a way that very few other people do. Uh, you like what you like. You're free to watch what you want to watch. It's your life. Do what makes you happy. I really don't understand the constant tearing down and, and mean-spirited attacks by Orioles fans against other Orioles fans. It doesn't matter how long you've been a fan. If you're new or old or a recent bandwagon edition, whatever, or you, you tuned out the last couple of years and are back again, it doesn't matter. We're all Orioles fans who really just want the same thing. Like, to be drunkenly celebrating an Orioles World Series victory together. I've never understood just the us first them mentality of, of so many Orioles fans on, on social media, but I guess that's just what this is, social media. Um, you know, but yeah, I think the only thing I, I will say is this, like Colton Kowser is going to have his struggles. Jordan Westberg will as well. Grayson is probably going to have his moments where he gets shelled between now and the end of the season. Adley is going to have his cold stretchers as well at the plate. Gunner is going to make mistakes. Like This team is very young, but this organization, in terms of player development, is in an elite tier. I'm not going to say they, they are the best. There are other organizations out there doing tremendous things as well. 
but the Orioles are certainly in that elite tier. Baseball is incredibly difficult, right? but this organization goes about preparing players for this in the right way. And so I just think enjoy the ride. But if you're going to jump on the ride, like you've got to ride out the highs and the lows, support the young players, celebrate their successes and have some fun. This team is a lot of fun. The players are fun. The atmosphere is fun. The competitive window is opening and it's opening wider and wider, I think, by really on a weekly basis, it seems like here lately. And I think it's going to stay open for a very long time. We'll move on to Matt here, who asked a prospect question. Love those. Matt says, could Zach Showalter be the next guy we see rise up prospect lists? And what is your outlook on him? I say absolutely. We're already seeing him shoot up some lists, Baseball in America in particular. He is number 24 right now on their top 30 update. That doesn't include draft picks, but I still think he's a top 30 guy, even when you add this most recent draft class. I have him in my top 30 after the draft. The three of us will put our top 50 update for August 1st together here in another week or so. And I imagine he'll still be firmly within the top 30 there as well. But I've said before that with Showalter being a mid-major commitment, someone who got a decent but not eye-opening signing bonus, I think he had like $440,000 signing bonus in the 10th round of last year's draft. I wasn't really sure coming into the year just how high his prospect status was, but I should also know by now like when the Orioles target a high school pick, it's for many, many good reasons. And Showalter has had a really great pro debut here, uh, really as great of pro debut as one could ask for, I think. Three starts in the FCL. He allowed just one earned run, 16 strikeouts to four walks, gets quickly bumped up to Delmarva as a 19-year-old with three pro games under his belt. And even after he got touched up a little bit on Saturday, he's still rocking a 2.08 ERA, 20 strikeouts, six walks in, 17 and a third low A innings. He's 6'2". He's got more room to fill out and really develop that starter's body. Maybe add a tick or two. He's already throwing 93 to 95. He's got the change up. He's got a sweeper. He's working on both those pitches. He's got decent control grades no matter which outlet you look at. And I know it's only low A, but one thing he's doing really well, and this is, again, to my untrained eye, but he's dominating the top of the zone with his fastball. Like Hitters can't catch up to it. They can't barrel it. And the fact that he's 19 and has moved so quickly, I think is a really good indication of what the Orioles think about him. And once more national evaluators get eyes on him and see what the Orioles have done with him over the last 12 months, I think you're going to see him get a lot more attention really across the board and not just on that Baseball America top 30 list. Right. Brandon asks, do you think the Orioles look into how a guy is on, how a guy is on and off the field before signing or trading for them? And is that something that you think about when a player is acquired? I feel like they always get quality people, which I love. Absolutely. I think it's a pretty big and important part of the evaluation process, and not just when talking about the draft. Like I'll once again reference a quote from Brad Selick when he was on this show last year because it's stuck with me ever since, just the fact that this organization doesn't want someone to fail because of their makeup. And you know, recent guest Joe Doyle touched on this in one of his podcasts talking about how the Orioles use their analysts to identify draft talent, and scouts and others in the org then go out and learn about who these guys are as people. And I think that carries into how the Orioles evaluate free agents and trade targets as well. Like they're going to do their homework on whoever it is. Like read the quotes from guys like Kyle Gibson, Ryan O'Hearn, Cole Irvin, and others who the Orioles have brought in. You know James McCann as well. Like it, it's not this is the Oriole way and you do it or leave kind of thing. It's having that growth mindset that we heard the organization preach about, especially during the pandemic and when it comes to player development, bringing in players who are willing to learn, bringing in players the younger guys can look up to. And I think I, I love it as well. I think as, you know, a, a dad of two and my son's almost four. So he's paying more attention to games and when they're on TV and he's asking questions and, you know, while I'm not going to force baseball on him, I do hope he eventually loves baseball and, and the Orioles as I do. And as he gets older, if he does, it's comforting to know that you, know, you look in that Orioles dugout, it doesn't matter who he is. Like you pick your favorite guy and you know, he's a good person on and off the field, right? You don't have the guys on this roster, like some other rosters where, you know, you might hear stories, you might hear things about that guy, and then you have to go off and explain to your kid what exactly that person did. Um, it is it is comforting. And just a really another really cool aspect about this organization, how they're really going about things the right way here, both on and off the field. We got another prospect question here from David C. Lots of Davids uh, in the Patreon chat, so trying to differentiate everybody here. David C. says, can you see a scenario where Joey Ortiz is the full-time starting shortstop or Kobe Mayo is the full-time starting third baseman? At the major league level, um, I don't think so, honestly. Like I've done my Ortiz rants, and I'm sticking with my thoughts about him, and my answer is not a knock on him at all. He is one of the top prospects in all of baseball. 
but he just happens to be in the same organization as Gunnar Henderson and Jackson Holiday. And of course, it does make a ton of sense to shop Ortiz, who can be a major part of a big time deal, but I think there's a place for him on this roster moving forward, probably as either the everyday starting second baseman or the utility guy. Like the way this organization likes to move guys around, very few positions are set in stone anyway. Gunnar Henderson is showing really everyone exactly what we've been saying for years now. Getting to balls and the arm strength was never a question with him. It was always the accuracy and slowing the game down. And when he reached the majors last year, and for much of this season, it was the same thing. Once he starts to slow the game down, he's going to be a great third baseman or shortstop on this team. And over the last couple of days, he's really been showing that. Jackson Holiday's defense is very real as well. So I think we're really looking at a possible gunner Jackson Holiday left side of the infield with Ortiz at second or Ortiz in the utility role. And for Kobe Mayo, his future is probably first base or the outfield. You know, I know others who think that he moves positions probably don't want to see him at first base because of that incredible arm. Honestly, like I, I don't care that much about what position he plays defensively. You know, I want that bat in the lineup. I think that's more important. Of course, the Orioles are going to maximize his arm strength. They're going to maximize his athleticism, and they're going to put him in a position to succeed and be a viable contributor on this team if he is someone who sticks around in this organization and becomes a key piece of the major league level. But, you know, honestly, I think at this point, if I have to pick one, though, I would say that Kobe Mayo is the has the higher odds of being the full-time starting third baseman, but I would not put very high odds on that at all. You know, all these guys, really except Gunner, still have a lot to prove. They got to prove themselves at the major league level. But I think the only thing that's guaranteed is that at least one of you know, Westberg, Ortiz, Mayo ends up getting traded. And, and if the Orioles want to make a big splash in the trade market, they can do so with one of those guys headlining the package and because there just isn't going to be enough room if they all pan out. You're not going to be able to put Westberg, Ortiz, Mayo, Gunner, and Holiday all on the infield. Right? You're not going to be able to... If you're looking at Heston Kerstad possibly taking over the first base job uh, from Ryan Mountcastle as well. Like there are too many positions, too many good players, and yes, some of these guys still have a lot to prove and have not proved themselves at the major league level yet, but if these guys continue to trend the way that they have been trending over the last year or two, some of them even longer, you're facing a very serious logjam here in the coming months. And so that's why I, I just I don't see either of them being full time either shortstop or third base. But yes, there are clearly still avenues where there can be full-time players here for the Orioles. Right, go to a, another prospect question here from Sterling, who says, in your opinion, out of Colton Kowser, Heston Kerstad, Judd Fabian, and Dylan Beavers, who has the highest ceiling and who has the highest floor? Follow-up, does Beavers have the largest floor-to-ceiling ratio in our system? If not, who would that be? So I think this is a pretty similar question to the one we got last year. I think it was what Connor Norby, Cesar Preto, Taron Vavra, highest floor, highest ceiling discussion. And you know that was a year ago. That was a year and a half ago before last season. That was a really tough question. And I think this one is too. Um, highest floor, I think I'm going to say probably Colin Kowser. I just think he has one of the best batter's eye in this organization. He's got off the charts on base ability, and I think he's going to hit for a solid average every year as well. There's an argument for Kerstad, but I just have more confidence in Kowser's hit tool. As for the highest ceiling, I'm sticking with Dylan Beavers. Like over the last month, he's shown us a glimpse of what he can do on the field. He can be a guy who, at his ceiling, hits for a high average, pushes for 30 home runs a year, steals a decent amount of bases, and plays a good corner outfield. I think he's a lefty bat with plus power and well above average defensive grades. And I'll quote Eric Longenhagen here over at Fangraphs, who described Beavers as having, quote, one of the freakier body athleticism power speed skill sets in the 2022 draft class. If this hit tool pans out, which the Orioles are working diligently on, Beavers is an everyday major leaguer with all-star potential, in my opinion. Like, there's a very long way to go, but that ceiling is there. And again, I'll put a close second option here as well and say Fabian. If you want to say Fabian has the higher ceiling, I, I could see that argument. I agree with you. I can make that argument as well. He's been striking out a good bit since being promoted to double A. It's kind of looking like a real three true outcome player down there in Bowie, but the defense is elite. The power is very real. I think there's an everyday major league center fielder who could have his share of 2020 seasons, but I just think Beavers is one of these players who a lot of people don't understand how elite I think he could be. However, to lead into the follow-up question there, does Beavers have the highest floor to ceiling ratio in our system? I will say yes. 
he could get to double A. You could see the strikeout rate balloon. And you could see guys really beat him with that high velo. That is something that has been noted publicly that he struggled with at college level on the Cape and Team USA experience, all of that. He struggled with fastball velo, 92 up. He had like some disastrous batting average against um, pitches in that in that velo range. But still, like he's working on all of this stuff. We've seen others in this organization learn how to hit breaking balls at an incredible rate after struggling their first year or so in the organization. We've seen guys be able to catch up to higher velo. They can do that. And at first it involves tweaking Beaver's swing and changing everything mechanically that the team wants to. And then it's going to be up to Beaver's to really settle in and start putting in the work and you know, showing the results on the field. And that could take time. But I think with him, the ceiling is just too high not to give it a try. And the outfield situation is so deep here in this organization that if it takes him just a little bit longer to develop, I think that's okay. He doesn't need to finish his first full year in the pros in AAA like others ahead of him have done recently. So just give him time and let's let's see if he can close that ratio there, close that gap between his floor and his ceiling and become the kind of player that I think the Orioles envisioned him when they drafted him out of California. Uh, next up, a question from Bobby Jones. Bobby says, when do we see Mayo, Kobe Mayo that is, in right field in Norfolk? Um, honestly, I, I thought we were going to see it in Bowie once he settled in at the plate. I talked about this at the beginning of the year, how you know Mayo had the injuries. We'll really go back even further. COVID taking away his 2020 senior year of high school. Then he has injuries his first two years in the pros that really had a pretty big impact on him at key points in his development. He's supposed to start off the season. He gets the knee injury. Last year, he gets a bump up to double A. He has the back spasms that hindered him for a little bit there. So I figured give him a few months in Bowie to fully settle in at the plate. Let's see that true breakout from the bat. And then they maybe start to move him around the field more. But he really only played first base and third base. Um, I don't think they bring him up to the majors this year. I think Kerstad's the only other big time prospect promotion we see at some point this season. So there's the, probably not a real big rush to get him out there in the outfield. They can wait, work with him in the fall, winter camps, and then bring him in during spring training maybe and work some more outfield drills in then. And then once he's closer to making his major league debut, maybe uh, we see him get more outfield reps. Again, if that's the plan that the Orioles have with him, we'll, we'll see what the plan is here over the next couple of months. The next question, we'll move back to the major league roster here. A question from Ben. Is Ciano Perez on the playoff roster for us? Um. Yeah. Before Perez went on the IL a couple weeks ago, you know he threw six shutout innings across five outings. Did not look good in his first outing back, but has since faced four batters and struck out three of them. Like We know the Orioles are big fans of Perez and his stuff, and unless they can find another lefty with his stuff via you know a trade or the waiver wire, I'm going to say yes, he's on this roster. And honestly, trading for someone with his caliber stuff is going to cost a lot. And I, I just think that this team is going to prioritize long-term goals first. Clearly, they are trying to improve the roster now, this year, and going to win, going for playoff victories. And I think Elias has even said, you know, rentals could be an option here. But Perez just doesn't seem like one of the guys who the organization will look to spin big to replace. Ideally, you know, D.L. Hall is that guy. Hard-throwing, lefty, high-leverage, late a guy that you could bring in. But we have no idea where D.L. Hall is. We have no idea what he's doing. We have no idea where he's at in his progression, what he looks like, what he's throwing, what the velo is. We know absolutely nothing about D.L. Hall this last, what, two months or so. So I, I'm not expecting D.L. Hall to be that option, but Perez has been really good over the last well, about a month. So I'd say the Orioles trust the Orioles. They know what they have in Perez. He's still on this roster at this point for a reason, because they like him, because they trust his stuff. And as long as he keeps pitching like he has for this last month, I think he'll he will be uh, he'll be okay on this roster. Uh, we got two more questions here before we wrap up. One from uh, Joseph. Joseph says, "Can you compare Enrique Bradfield Jr. to Drew Jones?" Um, I really don't think there's much comparison here, to be honest. Like Drew Jones, the injuries and his slow start aside, he has the potential to be a star in the majors with big time power, plus defense, plus speed, all of that. I know some national evaluators had Drew Jones ahead of Jackson Holiday going into last year's draft with, I think, Holiday probably probably being viewed as the guy with the higher floor, but Jones with the higher ceiling. You know, I, I, I kind of personally, I hate comparing players, though, because each player is unique with their own talents, their own timeline. So I really don't see a point in putting comps on guys or, or trying to compare players and, you know, and their timelines and their skill sets. But 
Bradfield does bring a different skill set. It's elite defense and speed with raw power that's not in the same conversation as Drew Johns. But he can be a table setter at the top of a major league lineup who steals a ton of bases, finds himself in the gold glove conversation frequently. Jones, meanwhile, is a potentially middle of the power bat who also brings speed and an impressive glove, which I don't think needs to be said considering like who his dad is, obviously. But I will say that Drew Jones has an extremely long way to go in his development. The injuries have already piled up. These are the three or four major injuries already. Reportedly, he's looked pretty rough against complex league breaking stuff, which are all factors, I think, as to why you see him fairly low on some top 100 list. But he's still just 19. But I, I think on the other hand, when you look at Enrique Bradfield, Bradfield, if you put him on AA Bowie's roster tomorrow, I I would bet he could give you Dante Williams production at AA right now. Maybe that's a bold take. Maybe that's too much. But I, I don't think it's crazy. And the point being that Bradfield has a much higher floor and with a few tweaks and some positive development, he can be someone who maybe you overlook throughout the year. Not Orioles fans, of course, that is. But from a national perspective, you look up on fan graphs in June, July, and you see where he is on the F4 leaderboard, and you're like, well, was not expecting to see Enrique Bradfield there. No. Regardless, I hope both of these guys have great careers because I think both can have a tremendous impact on the game. Yes, they're both great defensively. Yes, they both have good speed. But I think Bradfield's going to do it in a much quieter way at the top of the lineup get on base, make an impact with his glove and his uh, speed, while Drew Jones kind of makes that impact. If he reaches his potential, he's a guy who makes the impact with uh, the not just the high-flying defense, but also the crazy home runs. He's like 70-grade raw power. Hopefully, he he can get past these injuries and start tapping into that. Last question here, we'll wrap up with the David Adams series preview questions. The Orioles take on the Phillies and then the Yankees over the next two series. Monday will begin a three-game series against Philadelphia. They're currently 52 and 46, 11 and a half games behind Atlanta in the NL East, but just one game out of the wild card race in the National League right now. Looks like really just a five-team race for the NL wild card positioning, unless San Diego can finally start clicking. But I think that's really asking a lot for the Padres to start winning baseball games consistently. But the Phillies, at the time of this recording, have lost four straight, but they are a sub-500 team on the road. 13 games above 500 at home. So you're going to need a big Orioles contingent to show up to help counteract their home field advantage. And I imagine with these games being in Philly, O's fans will be rolling pretty deep. Fangrass right now has the matchups as Dean Kramer versus uh, Christopher Sanchez, Kyle Gibson versus Taiwan Walker, and then Kyle Bradish versus Ranger Suarez. So yeah, the Orioles do avoid Aaron Nola and Zach Wheeler, but Sanchez has been a low walk, high ground ball, effective lefty in his few starts this year. Tywin Walker is 11 and four with an ERA just a tick above four, and Suarez has, has been on a slide recently, but he's shown how lethal he can be with a real massive stretch just last month against the Dodgers, Braves, and Diamondbacks, where he allowed just two runs and 19 total innings. So those are two of the better teams in the NL and the Diamondbacks team, who it could be the NL West. I mean, you could be looking at three, two division winners and the top wild card team there, and Suarez really kept them in check there. So. The pitching, yes, you're avoiding the two aces or the ace in your top two starters there in Philly, but you know, don't overlook this pitching staff. The lineup, it's full of big names. Schwarber, Turner, Harper, Real Muto, Castellanos. Even Bryson Stott may not be that big national name, but he's been playing very well this year. But the Phillies offense ranks in the bottom half of the league in F4, WRC+, plus, walk rate, strikeout rate, home runs. I'll keep going, but it's the offense has not really been great this season. They have just a plus five run differential. So I think this is a series where if the bats click, taking two of three and winning this series should be fair game. But again, this is a trio of pitchers the Orioles are facing that are low walk or lower walk arms who do a really good job of keeping the ball on the ground. So you just can't fall into their trap there. Don't play their game. After an off day on Thursday, the Yankees will come to town for three game series. Um... Looks like Fangraphs has, it's freezing here, Grayson Rodriguez versus Clark Schmidt, Tyler Wells versus Garrett Cole, and Dean Kramer versus Luis Severino as the possible matchups. Um, the offense is, is floundering in New York right now. Only Oakland has a lower team batting average. New York's hitting just 230 on the year. They have a team on base percentage of just 300. The long ball is really what's saving this team. And as long as the rotation can get them successfully to the bullpen while keeping the game close, the Yankees bullpen has a combined ERA of 3.21 which is tops in baseball. The second best unit is Cleveland at 3.46. So this Yankees bullpen is, has been very good. You got to avoid giving up the, the big home runs here. Orioles fans are well familiar with this Yankees roster 
they knew who's on it. They know who's still missing up to this point. But it's it's been the long ball. Just avoid giving up the home runs in those key situations. Keep the bases clear as much as possible. And I think you can be okay. Uh, unfortunately, you know, guys like Grayson, Tyler Wells, and Dean Kramer do have tendencies to give up some big home runs. So I think that's going to be something really important to watch here. Uh, can these three guys be effective in must, not must win games, but like I mentioned earlier, these games are becoming much more important. So can they step up at home against a division rival who, yeah, the Yankees are in last place and they're currently down, but they're still five games over 500. So this team is still a force to be reckoned with. And this is going to be a really good test for three of our younger arms who to, to go up here in a playoff race and see if they can take down this Yankees lineup at home. And again, just avoid giving up the long ball at crucial times. Hopefully Aaron Judge isn't back. I know he was taking some live BP the other day before a game and some reports said it didn't look like he was favoring his foot at all. I don't know what exactly his timeline is, but it seems like he could be back soon. Hopefully uh, it's not before next uh, Friday when the Yankees come into town. But, you know, the Orioles are 18 and 12 right now at the time of this recording against ALE. So Hopefully that trend continues. That's all we can ask for. Um, thank you to everyone who submitted questions. These are some great questions. Some that I think could provoke some uh, even bigger conversations, maybe on some main shows at some point this year. Again, check out patreon.com slash on the verge. Get your questions in there. You can ask us and we will bring them up on next weekend's show. Come for the daily discussions, the daily hangouts, the daily podcast, all of it. The content never stops rolling here at On the Verge. In the meantime, uh, we will be back live for our main show Monday night. We'll talk some major leagues. We'll talk some prospect returns. A lot of notable pitchers, some top 30 pitching arms are back on the mound. They're performing well. Pitching in general across the farm system has been fantastic here over the last week or two. Excited to talk about all of that with Bob and Zach Monday night, 8 p.m. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Check it all out. Follow us on Twitter. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram. Give us that like, subscribe on YouTube as well, and uh, we will talk to you all Monday night. Thanks for listening. That'll do it for this week's episode of On The Verge. Be sure to check out our Patreon page where you can help show your support for the show and get bonus content, including monthly top 50 updates to our prospect list and daily game recaps during the season and much, much more.